I am such a speech geek, as you guys already know. Back when I was doing forensics in high school, I competed in a category called original oratory, and it was all about coming up with a persuasive topic and arguing a specific point of view. I love it. I think it's so important. So let's dive in. So first, let's take a look at your structure. Again, guys, like the rest of this course, this is designed to be very, very simple. Don't overthink it. Let me know if you have any questions. Once again, I have broken down the number of sentences for you guys. So we have your attention getter. So the past couple speeches, you probably have had an attention getter, but I'm emphasizing it for this one. Why is it important? Because this speech can have a tendency to be a little bit more dry, especially if it's a topic that other people may not know about or have given much thought in the past. It's usually about something relatively serious, although you can, and I definitely encourage you to have fun with it. You can do a silly topic if you want. So your attention getter is going to be one sentence that gets the audience's attention. Um, whatever your topic is, you want to throw out a little statement. It could be a statistic. It could be just a, a delightful little phrase that lets them know the general topic. I'll get into some more examples later on. So your relevance and credibility. This is going to be one to two sentences about why you are personally affected by this topic. Why are you passionate about it? Does it affect you personally? Does it affect your generation, your gender, people in your family? Do they have specific experiences with this? Does this affect society at large? Furthermore, why is it relevant to the audience? Why should we care? How does this affect society to the extent that every person should have a stake in the outcome? Your preview, just like the procedural, will be one sentence that lets us know what this speech is about. You will reveal your specific topic and tell the audience what points you are making, what perspective you will be looking at this, what is the lens you will be using, what is your first point, what is your second point. You will preview your first and second point without going into too much detail. You know, and I have one sentence here. It can be revealed in one sentence, but, you know, you could have a few more if needed. Um, so the first point, you'll spend about 25% of your speech getting into the meat of that first point, and then you'll transition to your second point. That'll take another 25% of your speech. So 50% of your speech will be taken up by explaining in depth your specific points, and then the other 50% will be on your attention getter, your credibility, your preview, and your review. The review, just as the last speech, is one to three sentences. You know, a couple more, give or take, explaining to the audience what you've just explained, recapping. And then your final statement will be a persuasive appeal to their values. So very similar to the last statement where you gave one sentence of inv invitation, such as if you would be interested in baking some chocolate chip cookies, go get your supplies and get to work in the kitchen. This will be another persuasive appeal to values. I really hope I've taught you something today about the importance of standing up for animal rights. I hope you go out there and use your voice to defend the small creatures who don't have one. You know, something like that, wrapping it all together and just ending with a strong statement. For this speech, you will include one source that you identify through research. It can be a statistic, it can be a fact, it can be a historical anecdote, but it will lend support to one of your points. And your source will include the source type, so that's, you know, whether or not it's a magazine article, an online article, a book, um, an encyclopedia, whatever it is, the source type, the title of the source, the author, and the date. And 
The next question I always get after I reveal this part is, what if there is no author? What if there is no date? What if there's no title? You know, this can happen sometimes with online articles. If that's the case, you will simply say, no author. Or you will say the words, no date. Or you will say, no title. Um, you're always going to know the source type. That's just where you got it. But sometimes you are missing some other information, and it's fine to say that you have no date or no author. You do want to say it because that clues me in to the fact that you looked for it. I just want to know that you guys know the four parts of a source citation. So if you just simply leave it out, I don't know that you know that that was supposed to be part of it. So just make sure you either say the information or say no date, no author, no title, whatever the case may be. So um, this speech again is five minutes. Uh, and if you keep it as simple as I showed, you will be able to get it in in five minutes. Again, there is no way you can really go into depth as needed on a persuasive speech if it's any less than two minutes. That just would not give you enough time to touch on the points and give it the depth and the meat that's necessary. So, um, here is an example. I just wanted to let you guys know what a source would sound like in the body of a speech because it can definitely cause you to fumble if you don't know how to eloquently say it because it is kind of a lot to get out of your mouth. It can sound like a little bit of a mouthful, but if you write down what you want to say word for word and practice it, you can get a handle on it. It's not the kind of thing that um, necessarily should be memorized. And I, even though I recommend that a lot of types, especially those more into improvising, should just make keyword outlines, your sentence that you include your source, you probably will want to write out word for word. Here is an example of what a sentence would sound like with all four parts of a citation included. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. This is a relatable statement and the number one regret of people as they reach the end of their lives, according to an online article from Guardian that went viral in 2012, entitled Top 5 Regrets of the Dying, written by Susie Steiner. So you can see... Um, in those few sentences, I include the source type, which is the online article from The Guardian, the year 2012, the title, Top 5 Regrets of the Dying, and the author, Susie Steiner. You don't have to reveal these parts in any particular order. You could give the source first and then give the information second. You could give the author's name first and the date last. It doesn't really matter. Just try to make it flow into one or two sentences and, you know, write it down and practice so that it comes out of your mouth smoothly. And if you do it that way, it's not going to trip you up at all. Okay, so for grading. So for this speech, of course, the emphasis is going to be on logos. We did our pathos with the wedding toast. We did our ethos with the procedural. And now we are doing logos, which is the logic of your speech. And the persuasive speech focuses a lot on logical appeals, although you will probably include some emotional appeals and the statements that you make. So what is logos in regard to this speech? That will be your point clarification, your linear presentation through which you express your ideas, your clear transitions, and your summarizing of your points. So you're previewing and summarizing, telling the audience where you're going to go, where you are, and where you've been, just like you did in the procedural, having those clear transitions. Your ethos will be including complete sources that lend support to audience. Um, you know, so by showing that you did your research, by showing that you have some sort of experience with this or that the audience will have some sort of experience with this, it lends that support and just serves it up on a silver platter right to the audience. 
So your pathos will be your emotional appeals. And any strong argument, by the way, will include emotional appeals because as humans, we are emotional creatures. So it's more than logic for us. Um, and just explaining why this is relevant, once again, that ties into ethos, but it also ties into pathos because it's about how we all function and feel as emotional creatures. Your vocal expression will be, once again, the animation and diction in your voice. Nothing new. Once again, having an animated voice tone and using your consonants as you speak. Your facial expression will be those animated facial expressions. You know, smiling when you talk about something lighthearted, showing a serious face when you talk about something serious, making your eyes really wide, squinting your eyes, moving your eyes around, gesturing if it's appropriate. I know gesturing can be kind of tough to do on video, but natural gestures can go a long way, especially in a persuasive speech, to really emphasize your points and bring them home. So going a little bit deeper into logos. So you really do want to clarify your points. And, you know, I chose this little graphic on this PowerPoint slide because you're literally transmitting your ideas from your head to everyone else. So it's it's an idea exchange. And in order for that to happen effectively, your points have to be super clear and comprehensive to your audience. So by keeping your presentation linear, following the stru- structure, having these really clear transitions and summarizing everybody at the end, you at least keep us on the same page as you. Now, just following you doesn't necessarily mean that your audience is going to agree with everything you have to say. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions. And I really wish we had time for a debate and to go back and forth. Unfortunately, we don't. But... Um, I, I love the art of debate because it opens the floor for a variety of different opinions. And guys, we're living in a time where sometimes people try to silence each other. I'm sure you've seen it on social media. People getting hot and heavy about certain political or personal opinions and other people immediately try to just shut them right down. And a lot of people aren't very nice to each other. And you don't have to be mean or oppressive or silence others to get your point across. There is a way to debate with kindness. And I personally believe that no problem can be solved in society, especially big, complicated problems, without multiple opinions being brought to the table. We got to get through everything, all the polarization, all the diverse opinions so that we can dissect each thought and really make strides toward solving some problems, which is the whole goal of persuasion. It's about problem solving. So just for fun, I included some topic examples because a lot of times, you know, students know right away what they're passionate about. They know what they want to make a speech about, and then other times they're struggling for topic ideas. You know, there are certain topics that really get overdone. You probably can, you know, think about what those might be, like abortion, gun control, uh, legalization of marijuana (laughs) would be some examples. Um, I, I like to encourage students to be a little bit more creative and get a little bit more philosophical. Some sometimes the most fun topics can be lighthearted topics. You know, I've I've heard people do do speeches about why everyone should have a dog or why no one should have a dog or why chocolate is superior to caramel. You know, you can you can make it silly and as long as you follow the structure and show that you did your research and you cited something that makes this topic relevant to yourself and your audience, you're still still doing a great job on your persuasive speech. So if you have a topic you're not really sure about, you think it might be too controversial or you think it might be too silly, just shoot me an email. I'll let you know. So here are some examples I included based on some debates we did in the past. Back when I, you know, taught this as a longer semester class with fewer students, we would get on debate teams and we would debate some of these topics. And these are great, great ideas to maybe get you started in your brainstorming process when you're deciding what topic you want to do this speech on. So, you know, for example, 
So you could argue that social media is a productive use of time. On the other hand, you could argue that social media is a waste of time. For both ends of the spectrum, you could include your points as the categories psychological effects and networking features. While talking about point one, the psychological effects of social media, you could cite statistics saying that social media actually prevented feelings of isolation and depression. You could then move on to talk about networking features and explain your opinions and experiences about how you've been able to use social media to make friends that later led you to valuable opportunities such as internships or jobs or maybe even introduced you to a really important relationship like your future spouse. So one of your points will be more research-based and will include your citation, and the other point will be more opinion-based, more based on anecdotes, maybe stories that you've experienced or collected from others. So another topic would be vacation versus staycation. You know, what is the best use of leisure time when you have time free from work or school? Would you rather go on a vacation or stay home for a staycation? You could argue either point on the basis of making memories and exploration. So your preview for that topic might sound a little something like this. Today, I'm going to convince you why a staycation is a great way to spend your vacation time. I will cover the point of making memories and the point of exploration in my explanation something nice and simple. Then you transition to making memories. And you might talk about how, you know, having a staycation and just sticking with activities that are nearby can introduce you to new habits or ways of being that you haven't yet carried out in your life and that you don't need to travel far to get that experience. You can make these valuable memories right here. Then you can move on to your second point of exploration. And you could talk about how when we stay home and when we commit to exploring something new right here, it gives us a greater sense of appreciation for where we live. Um... You know, and in that one, you could actually cite some neuroscience research that talks about the benefits of exploration and novelty to the brain and how this might actually impact longevity, which I've read that it does. So the first point, making memories, could be totally your opinion. And the point about exploration could be backed up by scientific neurological research. Chasing big career dreams versus choosing a practical career. Let's say you're going to convince the audience that they, want to, that they should choose a more practical career. You might say something like, Today I'm going to dive in and explore with you the importance of choosing a practical career that's, a, that's perfect for the community in which you live rather than chasing big dreams that would only be self-serving. We're going to take a look at long-term happiness and work-life balance and how these aspects of life are positively affected by choosing a practical career. Now let's go back to the slide of structure and look, take another look at our source. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. This is a relatable statement and the number one regret of people as they reach the end of their lives, according to an online article from The Guardian that went viral in 2012, entitled Top 5 Regrets of the Dying, written by Susie Steiner. That source could be used to argue the point that we should all be chasing big dreams, that we shouldn't settle for practicality, or... That exact same statement could be used to argue that we should choose a career that is practical for ourselves and our community rather than dealing with the soul-crushing effects of going for a big, unrealistic dream. 
We could argue that people on their deathbeds would be much more happy and fulfilled if they had chosen something that they would definitely succeed at and that they could have that fulfillment in knowing that they shared their talents with their community or the world at large. You know, debating is about highlighting points that at the end of the day are completely subjective. We try to make them objective with research, but at the end of the day, they're opinion-based and there are always two sides to the coin. That's why every topic, you can argue both ends on the different polarities, the opposite ends of the spectrum. So you have your attention getter. Ah, a wonderful staycation. I have some time off work next week. I can't wait to hunker down, make some memories, and explore the Roanoke Valley. That would be a pretty funny and engaging attention getter if you were talking about the benefits of a staycation. Relevance and credibility. Give one to two sentences about how you have always enjoyed staycations and just highlight some of the great memories and discoveries you've made about your community by committing to a staycation. Preview your points. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about the benefits of using leisure time to go on a staycation. We're going to dive into making memories and exploration right here in the Roanoke Valley. For my first point, let's dive into how we can make some really good memories here in Roanoke. You know, then you offer your examples, you give your opinions. Now that we've talked about making good memories, let's dive into how we can engage our exploration brain faculties by going to new and exciting places that are just right down the road. Then you might drop your statistic, your neurological research that you found in Psychology Today, giving an author and a date and a title. Now that we have talked about the benefits of a staycation in terms of making memories and exploration, I would like to encourage you guys to be intentional about how you enjoy your time here in Roanoke. So that would be like a nice little review, final statement with persuasive appeals to values, boom. 